POCO F4 Long Term Review 1 Introduction Introduction Back in its day, the POCO F3 was a huge hit, perhaps the biggest since the original POCO F1. While nowhere near that phone's price point, it was still very nicely priced for a flagship killer, and the specs were on point. That naturally made us very interested in its successor, the POCO F4 and whether it was able to replicate the F3S formula well or not. Now that it's been on the market for quite some time, we feel like we can have a more accurate glimpse of that. Also, it's gotten a few software updates, so any initial issues should have been sorted. With all that in mind, we decided to take it for an extended spin, living with it day in, day out as our one and only smartphone to create this long-term review that aims to give you an idea of what it's like as a daily driver. POCO F4 Long-Term Review We'll say it right from the outset, this is a weird one. It launched with the same SoC as its predecessor, which was surprising enough, but checking European pricing currently reveals something even more surprising, there's basically been no price cut, even now, over five months after its release. That's definitely not PAR for the course for POCO. Since the price is rather similar to what the F3S used to be before the F4 came around, we'll venture a guess and say we don't think a lot of owners of the former decided to purchase the latter, which is probably for the best. Maybe the F5 will soon bring upgrades that are going to make that worth it, we'll have to wait and see. POCO F4 Long Term Review In the meantime, Let's try and ascertain how good a buy the POCO F4 is at the end of 2022, in a very crowded field. We mean the mid-range field, although its chipset choice actually places it in a strange middle spot between traditional mid-rangers and flagship killers, to qualify as which it would have to sport a newer SoC. Join us over the next few pages as we decode what it all means, what the upsides are, and what downsides you should expect if you choose to get one of these in the near future. 2. Design, Biometrics, Speakers Design The POCO F4 looks like a smartphone from 2022 from the front. It's practically all screen with a tiny centered hole punch for the camera, small bezels on three sides, and a slightly larger chin. We've seen this formula a lot before, but we're not complaining. Sure, the chin could have been exactly as narrow as the rest of the bezels, but that's just nitpicking at this price point. POCO F4 Long Term Review More annoying is the silver ring around the selfie camera, which serves no purpose other than to draw attention to itself constantly as light reflects off of it. The whole point of tiny hole punch cutouts was supposed to be to make the camera pretty much disappear in the sea of screen surrounding it, and that entire idea is completely negated by this silver ring. Baffling Choice but definitely something you can get used to pretty quickly. POCO F4 Long Term Review The frame is plastic, in an obvious cost-cutting measure, and it's also pretty flat because every Chinese smartphone maker needs to copy Apple's designs for whatever reason. Unlike others, we don't really have a strong opinion on flat-framed devices, we find them fine, not particularly exciting, but not particularly annoying either. The plastic build will come through in how the frame isn't as cold as a metal one would be, and if you're put off by that, you should probably be looking elsewhere. POCO F4 Long Term Review It's good to note that this is not the most premium feeling phone to hold because you are simply touching more plastic than with a non-flat frame. Any other device with a plastic frame that isn't this flat will feel less plasticky by design. If you mind that, you've been warned. If you plan to use a case, this entire point is moot. The back of the POCO F4 has glass on it, which is a step up in the premiumness factor, and a weirdly looking two-step camera island that takes it back down a notch. We can't really explain why, but the main, thickest part of the island, where the three sensors are, just doesn't really look all that glamorous. It screams cheap, ER, phone, but in a subtle way. A whispered scream, if you will. The strange two-step design, unfortunately, does draw a lot of attention, however, and we're still unsure why the LED flash array needed its own hump, is it really that deep? POCO F4 Long Term Review Anyway, 
the obligatory text on the camera bump is less obnoxious than some others we've seen, but still completely superfluous. No one needs to read 64 MPOISAI triple camera on the back of your phone, for any reason. Ever. Period. At least these words do make some semblance of sense, with the very loose meaning of AI of course, unlike what we've encountered on the back of the POCO F4 GT in a previous long-term review where the words on the camera island read, freezing. Speediest. Still, from where we're standing, text on camera islands is always completely unnecessary unless it's camera specs and even that is hard to justify on a phone. POCO F4 Long-Term Review On the other hand, the regulatory paragraph in the lower right side of the back is actually necessary, which is an unfortunate reality in Europe. This is also where you can point to if POCO insists on telling you that it's a completely independent brand. We've had smartphones for so long, and yet the European authorities still can't make all of this text go away? Perhaps they're too busy mandating charging standards. Maybe next year? We can hope. POCO F4 Long-Term Review Anyway, the rest of the phone's back is empty aside from the prominent, but not too much, as we've definitely seen worse, POCO logo that's joined by a 5G one that can't become redundant too soon. The glass feels like glass, is as slippery as you'd expect, and that's about all we can say here. The phone itself is definitely not among the worst offenders when it comes to slipperiness, as the plastic frame isn't as much as metal ones usually are, and the glass finish also aids with that. It just doesn't help the device stand out in any way. It is, dare we say it, incredibly boring looking. That's not necessarily a bad thing, mind you, a lot of people might in fact prefer that. Plus, if you're going to slap a case on it anyway, then the most important thing is the case's design as that's what you'll really be showcasing all day long. Case That brings us neatly to the subject of the bundled case. We appreciate the fact that there is one to begin with, especially as there usually are only a few quality third-party options for brands that aren't Apple or Samsung or Google. The case itself, while not the sturdiest feeling we've ever encountered in a smartphone box, also isn't as cheap feeling and flimsy as the one that ships with the POCO F4 GT for example. It's a very middle-of-the-road thing that still does manage to offer some level of protection, we dropped the F4 once from about 80 centimeters on a tiled floor, and it survived unscathed. POCO F4 Long-Term Review The case has an interesting way of dealing with the two-step camera cutout by basically bulging at the first step and only having an actual cutout around the LED flash array. This means that, if you're right-handed, while you hold the phone your index finger will constantly run into this protrusion, for better or worse. Its ridge can be used as a place to rest your finger against, so that would be the for better side, while on the other hand, it's a constant thing you're hitting in day-to-day -day use. That might not be great for a lot of people, but there's no way around it, really given the design of that island. Handling, build quality. Handling is great if you have hands on the larger side, okay if mid-sized, and as bad as any mainstream smartphone for the past few years if they're small. The POCO F4 has a nice weight to it, that's right in the Goldilocks zone in this reviewer's opinion, where it's enough to make it feel substantial, but not as much as to require breaks in usage to rest your hands. POCO F4 Long-Term Review Build quality is outstanding, but as we've already discussed, this definitely doesn't feel as premium as more expensive devices that use metal frames. We're only saying this, so you keep it in mind and don't get disappointed, think of a run-of-the-mill red my note, and the feeling here is quite similar, which is no accident since this was initially launched in China as the Redmi K40s, though with a lesser camera. Xiaomi slash Redmi slash Poco naming and rebranding shenanigans are still ongoing. Fingerprint Sensor Face Unlock The POCO F4 has a side-mounted fingerprint sensor that lives inside its power button, and it's among the best we've ever used, although not quite the best. Unlocking accuracy on the first try was around 95%, which is very good, but the POCO F4 GT sensor that we've recently reviewed long-term fared much better with practically 100% accuracy on the first try. 
Comparatively, this may seem bad, but the POCO F4S sensor is perfectly adequate and similar to most side-mounted ones, it's just that the F4 GTs was an outlier in how good it was. POCO F4 Long-Term Review As usual, there's an option to either scan your fingerprint upon touching the key or pressing it, and we always go for the latter as it ensures no accidental unlocks while simply handling the phone. It also makes sense to press the power button to unlock the screen, and this is a two-for-one deal where that does happen, yes, but in a very secure fashion. Biometrics Settings There's face unlocking too, and it doesn't work when your eyes are closed, we checked, but with the fingerprint sensor being this good, we're not sure why you'd want to use it, especially since it's less secure. Perhaps if you only unlock using double-tapping the screen? Then face unlocking is faster, of course, but if you use the power button mainly, like we do, it's very redundant. Speakers The POCO F4S speakers are perfectly adequate for the job, and we're happy that there's two of them. No matter how good a single down-firing speaker is, it can't touch a dual setup. As usual for Xiaomi and POCO phones of late, the top speaker has two outlets, the earpiece and an additional slit in the top side of the frame. This means that when you're talking on the phone, some of your call's audio will leak out into your surroundings, it's just an inevitable consequence of how it's set up. On the plus side, you do get fuller sound from that speaker than you would have if its only outlet was the earpiece. POCO F4 Long-Term Review The speakers aren't the best quality ones out there, but they do sound very good and there's also plenty of volume to comfortably consume media in silent or not very loud environments. In loud areas, you will have to bring the phone closer to your ears to hear what's going on, but that's a limitation all phone speakers currently have. While these weren't the loudest we've heard, they weren't far off and overall, they're very good and unlikely to disappoint, even if they don't stand out in any particular way. Vibration Motor the POCO F4S vibration motor is fine, but not much more than that. This might be one of those areas where some cash was saved, as it feels like it completely lacks any depth, whereas the best ones feel 3D, for lack of a better description, this one's clearly in the 2D camp. Like all modern ones, it's also of the feel it more than hear it variety, which is okay for the more 3D ones, but in this case, because of that lack of depth, there's not much oomph in it at all. So even inside your pocket, if it engages when you're on a busy street with a lot of noise and vibrations of its own, you might actually miss the notification or call or whatever else it could be. Haptic Feedback Settings So we'd call this passable for the price, but Xiaomi and its sub-brands are definitely capable of doing better, see, for example, the recently reviewed long-term POCO F4 GT which offers a very different experience. Anyway, unless you've had some experience with the best of the best, this vibration motor isn't likely to feel very bad, it's not like those in the cheapest phones used to be a few years ago. It's just not on PAR with the best out there, so you should definitely tune your expectations accordingly. 3 Display, Performance, Battery Life Display Resolution, Brightness, Quality the POCO F4S screen is flat, since it launched in an era when mid-rangers didn't really get curved screens, for obvious cost-cutting reasons. Although its chipset doesn't let us call this a flagship killer, those two generally come with flat displays. And the resolution is the same 1080p+, which we'd still wager no sane person can, in real life, without magnification, differentiate from 1440p+. In other words, we don't think the resolution will ever be an issue for you if you go with this phone. We can say a similar thing for brightness, as this panel has an impressive four-digit maximum level according to our tests, which is not something seen very often at this price point. To put it into perspective, it's 40% brighter than the POCO F3S screen in our tests, and that's one of those commendable upgrades that are hard to spot if you only look at spec sheets. POCO F4 Long-Term Review Minimum brightness is fine, too, although it's on the fence where even a little more could be too much for a lot of people when using the phone in pitch darkness. Having dark mode on definitely helps not get a retina-searing feeling, 
but we wish MIUI would incorporate Google's extra DIM feature sooner, rather than later. That would allow for fine-tuning of the minimum level, and we're sure everyone would be able to find their perfect spot. Maybe that's coming in MIUI 14? We hope so. Throughout our time with the POCO F4, we found the auto brightness algorithm generally decent, although by no means among the best we've experienced recently. And that's because it has a tendency to always keep the screen brighter than it should be for a given level of ambient lighting. It's almost like the auto brightness is set up to constantly advertise the high brightness capabilities of the screen to everyone around you. Joking aside, this meant we had to constantly do manual adjustments for the first week or two of using the phone. Those got remembered as they should be, and after that, it was all smooth sailing in that regard. Display Settings, POCO F4 Long-Term Review Display Settings, POCO F4 Long-Term Review Display Settings We also found that the phone was rather slow to react when we went from a bright place to a dimmer one, sometimes taking almost a minute to lower the brightness. It's not the same the other way round, though, aided in part by the fact that it has an extra ambient light sensor on its back, it reacts very quickly to going from dim surroundings to brighter ones. Note that if you like your screens incredibly bright at all times, you'll love what auto brightness is doing here right out of the box. Quality-wise, the panel is very good too. The default vivid color profile is very accurate to the DCI-P3 color space, albeit with blue-tinted whites and grays, while original color reproduces sRGB to AT confusingly, there's an advanced settings option which lets you manually specify P3 or sRGB, which seems very redundant to us. Color Scheme Settings, POCO F4 Long-Term Review 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 Color Scheme Settings, POCO F4 Long-Term Review. Color Scheme Settings Since most content on the internet is still sRGB, we went with original color and warm for the color temperature, as whites were still a bit too blue to our eyes. The good thing though is that there's ample room for customization of the color profile to your heart's content. Reading Mode, Always On Display And speaking of that, MIUI's reading mode remains by far the most customizable blue light filter in the mobile world with an order of magnitude more options on offer than what its competitors give you. Aside from the classic mode, with its color temperature slider, which is similar to every other blue light filter out there, you also get the textured effect paper mode, complete with an extra texture slider too, and options to go for full colors, desaturated light colors, or black and white. Naturally, there's also a scheduling feature if you want this to go live at sunset and turn off at sunrise, or you can set custom hours. Reading Mode Settings, POCO F4 Long-Term Review 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 Reading Mode Settings, POCO F4 Long-Term Review. Reading Mode Settings. Finally, on the display-related customization options front, the always-on display is also among the most flexible out there, with a lot of stuff you can have just right. We're talking text, analog, and digital clocks, kaleidoscopes and other backgrounds, scheduling, and setting whether you want it to be truly always-on or just appear for 10 seconds after you tap the screen. We used to be huge fans of the former yet recently, we're gravitating more towards the latter, but of course, you may have different ideas, and the point here is that you can surely find some setting combination to suit your tastes. Always on display settings. Refresh rate. The POCO F4 has a 120 Hz refresh rate screen, but it's by default set to dynamically adjust based on usage. If you want it to be at 120 Hz more often, you need to switch to custom mode and then pick 120 Hz. This doesn't make everything run at that level all the time, mind you, since it goes down to 60 Hz when showing static images, as well as for video playback. There are also some apps that are kept at this rate, and when showing the always on display, the refresh rate goes to 30 Hz. Refresh Rate Settings, POCO F4 Long Term Review Refresh Rate Settings, 
POCO F4 Long Term Review Refresh Rate Settings Overall, it's a decent system but obviously has nowhere near the flexibility that an LTPO panel would provide. Then again, the whole point of that is to save battery, and as you'll see in the relevant section, the POCO F4 has great endurance as it is. More importantly, despite the switching to lower refresh rates, the phone never felt hindered, it never felt like its screen couldn't go past 60 Hz, for example. Having only a few refresh rate steps and not going more dynamic is probably what made this screen cheap enough to be included in this handset, and we can't condemn the decision of going with it, it has amazing brightness for the price, and it's very good quality too. Performance, Smoothness The POCO F4 is probably the smoothest phone we've ever used, of those powered by the Snapdragon 865-865 Plus-870 triplets. That said, it can't compete in this regard with the newer socks. The differences aren't huge, but they are there, and they are noticeable. The Snapdragon 870 is getting pretty old these days, and yet it still allows for smoothness to feel almost on PAR with its successors for most casual usage scenarios on the POCO F4. Where it really falls down is when the Play Store is updating some apps, and you try to do anything else at the same time. You'll see choppiness that is simply not present on a phone with a newer chipset but is reminiscent of what happens on devices with various Snapdragon 600 series mid-range socks, although the extent of the choppiness on those is heightened. POCO F4 Long-Term Review Performance-wise, the phone is in a very similar boat. It can handle most things you throw at it, but heavy multitasking with heavy apps will get to a point where it starts to feel choppy. Likewise, with casual games versus big, heavy titles. It's still probably better at all of this stuff than any dedicated mid-range chip because it was the top dog in its day, but it can't really live up to the ones that came after it. And that's perfectly fine, if you approach this handset as a mid-ranger with a better than average SoC, which is basically what it is at this point. If you come from the other direction and think of it as a flagship killer with performance on PAR or incredibly close to that of current flagships, it won't deliver. Expectations are important. Battery life, charging. Unlike some other high-end chipsets from Qualcomm, the Snapdragon 870 never had any issues with battery life, and it still doesn't. In fact, we got some great results from the POCO F4S decidedly not very impressively sized 4,500 mAh cell capacity. These numbers are on PAR with a lot of devices using 5,000 mAh batteries, which is a testament to the 870's efficiency. On an average day, we could get about 6 to 7 hours of screen on time with our use case, detailed below. That's above average performance for sure, which we'd call great but not record-shattering. Still, it's impressive, given the capacity the phone has to work with. Our best ever result was 8 hours and 46 minutes of screen on time with 22% of the battery still remaining, but this was an outlier, keep that in mind. Battery life snapshots from different days. We never saw under 6 hours, if you factor in the remaining battery capacity at the time the screenshots were taken and we'd go as far as to say 7 hours is easily achievable on a regular basis with a usage scenario close to ours. This is better battery life than we got from the POCO F4 GT, which has a slightly larger 4700 mAh cell. Our use case involves 12 to 17 hours off the charger each day, with mostly Wi-Fi 6 connectivity, about half an hour to an hour on 5G, location always on, and about half an hour of navigation via Waze. Bluetooth always on and an hour or two of listening to podcasts or music via TWS earbuds, and an hour of phone calls via TWS earbuds too. Obviously, if your personal use case is much more demanding, say, spending a lot of time on mobile data where the signal isn't great, then your screen on time numbers won't be as high as ours. Conversely, if you are a lighter user than this reviewer, you'll get more. POCO F4 Long Term Review one of the very few upgrades in the F4 compared to the F3 is the charging capacity, which went up to 67W from 33W. This means going from zero to full in 38 minutes. That's still nothing to scoff at, 
but other devices from the same stable, like the Poco F4 GT, managed to impress even more with 17 minutes, thanks to 120W support. That phone is in a higher price tier, too, so we're not saying the F4 should have gone as high, but this is definitely going to be an important differentiating feature for its successor if it can pull it off. There's nothing that comes close to the peace of mind you get knowing it takes less than 20 minutes to fully charge your phone. And yes, 38 minutes isn't all that much either, but it's not as impressive as it used to be anymore. Unless you're coming to this from an Apple or Google device, in which case it's probably going to be mind-blowing in comparison. For software Updates what probably best illustrates what you should expect from POCO in terms of updates for this phone is the fact that we can't remember when we received the last one. We've spent many weeks with this device, and it definitely didn't arrive recently. That's what you'll be getting, in a nutshell. Yes, there are updates, but they are few and far between. So if you care about receiving the monthly security patches on an actual month-by-month -month basis, this is definitely not the phone for you nor, might we add, any other POCO or Redmi or Xiaomi. POCO and Redmi especially focus on trying to give you the most bang, in terms of specs, for your buck, and that unfortunately comes with a side effect of neglecting the software update side, compared to some of the competition, say, Samsung. Then again, POCO and Redmi devices are generally better specced at similar price points, and they're also usually smoother than the Samsungs they directly compete with, so it's not like you're not getting anything in return here. This situation is just something to keep in mind, as it doesn't seem like POCO is planning on changing anything about it anytime soon. POCO F4 Long-Term Review Hence, our F4 intended for the European market is, and has been for who knows how long, on MIUI 13.0.5, based on Android 12 with the August 2022 security patch level. A new update will probably arrive in the next few weeks, but the one after that? It's impossible to tell. As for big ones, the POCO F4 should get MIUI 14, although nothing has been confirmed on the matter yet. Android 13? Most likely, but don't expect that to arrive soon and keep in mind that MIUI is a very heavy skin, so even if your device gets the next version of the underlying OS, most of the user-facing features that Google announces each year won't look the same. Some won't even be available at all, looking at you, extra dim. Current software We can rationalize the entire update situation more easily for a handset costing as much, or rather, as little, as the POCO F4, but it does get harder the more we climb the price ladder which is why we give Xiaomi's flagships a much harder time about updates. At those prices, this is unacceptable. At the POCO F4S, it might be slightly more acceptable, although still definitely nothing to praise. MIUI 13 MIUI 13 has been around for a while now, and it feels like it's been around for much longer than that in fact since it shares a lot of its looks with MIUI 12.5 and MIUI 12. With every new device we review long term that runs MIUI, we mention that the skin might be in need of a new coat of paint, since it has had a very similar vibe for years now. Of course, you might disagree and find it the most beautiful thing ever, it's all subjective when it comes to such things. POCO F4 Long Term Review We will however say that the entire user experience of handling a phone with MIUI 13, the POCO F4 included, is generally very good. There are still some quirks, but if you don't find the looks to be getting rather stale, you're in for a treat with all the nice animations and pops of color everywhere. It's definitely a joy to use, even if it might take a little bit of adjustment if you're coming to it from a different skin. MIUI 13 Settings Especially the settings menu can be intimidating to first-time users, since it has an incredibly high number of things packed inside it, in sometimes confusing ways. System Apps Updater? Sure, that makes sense, until you realize that not all system apps use it, some get updated through the Play Store instead. Let's just say we're thankful that there's a search function, and that it works pretty well. Launcher, Recents, Control Center. 
The launcher is the usual Poco Fair, with a few customization options but nothing too extreme that would put off more casual users. It's fine to use as is from the box, but if you want to tweak things, you can do that too. It goes without saying that there's an app drawer, and there's an option to have an A to Z scale in place of the scroll bar, which we love. Tapping the first letter of an app's name over there is consistently the fastest way to get to any app, we have found, it beats searching hands down, and this might prove to be very important to you, if, like us, you have over 300 apps installed. Launcher and its settings The recent app's display is still vertical by default, since MIUI loves its quirky two-column layout, but thankfully you can change that and have it horizontally scrolling like every other Android skin out there does it. Of course, if you're among the people who love the vertical layout, you'll enjoy the way things work out of the box. Recent apps display and setting Speaking of choosing between old and new ways to do things, let's get to the control center, shall we? That's what MIUI is calling its clone of Apple's control center, which is the new way to go about it, and the default. However, if you don't enjoy splitting notifications and controls, then you can go back to the old way, with quick settings icons above notifications. When the new control center came out, we did try it out, but in the end found that we feel Android's way of approaching this makes more sense. If you have the controls above the notifications, then the notifications are more easily reachable without thumb gymnastics. There's also added ease of use stemming from the fact that you don't have to be careful which side you swipe down from. Our preferred control center style. Finally, we'll note that for right-handed people, having to swipe from the left side for notifications isn't great if you want to do said swiping with your right thumb while your right hand is holding the phone, especially if you have to check out notifications many more times throughout the day than the control center. Hopefully we've made a solid case against the new control center, but if you like it more, none of our opinions matter, and you can enjoy it without issue. Dark Mode, Gestures As any other modern skin, MIUI 13 comes with a dark mode, which can be scheduled too, either to come on from sunset to sunrise or according to a custom schedule. You can also force it onto individual apps and we're happy to report that on the POCO F4 this functionality actually works. We were previously frustrated by the fact that the F4 GT, which we've recently reviewed long term, while in theory having the same feature, was only able to force dark mode onto the Amazon shopping app, and none other. On the POCO F4, you get a list of your apps, and the most recently used ones are up top for quick access. Although we would have appreciated a way to customize the sort order, this one does actually make a lot of sense, since we're assuming the most often met scenario is you open an app, get annoyed by the fact that it doesn't have a dark theme of its own, then jump into settings to force dark mode onto it. Dark mode settings. In that case, it will be right at the top of the list. We also appreciate that the forcing is off by default, way back in the day when this feature was first starting to appear. We saw some instances of it being on by default for all apps, which led to display issues with a lot of those that have their own dark themes. So it's all good on this front on the F4, which makes us even more baffled about the state of things on the F4 GT. These phones share a part of their names, and they both run MIUI 13, yet the behavior of this feature is very different. This just tells you that bugs on the F4 GT are aplenty as we've discussed at length in its long-term review. Thankfully, however, that's not been the case on the F4, as our experience was pretty much bug-free. And that's quite a refreshing change, although the update cadence means if you are unlucky to get a bug at some point, it will stay with you for many months until it's, hopefully, fixed by the next update. Gesture Navigation Settings The POCO F4 also has gesture navigation of course, and as usual in MIUI you can turn off the pointless and annoying white pill bar at the bottom once you've enabled it. We found gestures to be working perfectly, although for the few of you who may have loved the quick switch to the previous app by holding the back gesture function, it's a sad day since that doesn't work on this phone. Swiping across the bottom of the screen does accomplish the same task, however, and arguably does it ever so slightly quicker, 
so perhaps that's a good replacement. 5. Camera Camera image quality For the first time in the F-Series, there's OIS on the main camera, and yes that's important enough to warrant us starting this section with that bit of news. Obviously it's a good thing for camera use, and we're assuming Samsung's addition of OIS onto some of its mid-rangers might have convinced Poco to do the same. Whatever it was, it's good to see it here. On the other hand, the main snapper still isn't anything to write home about, at least specs-wise, which is pretty much what we expected from the F-Series. These phones have never been about the best camera image quality, while also never being among the worst at the camera game. But one area where flagship killers and mid-rangers cost cut alike is exactly this, and we feel like, on paper, the F4 is no different. But let's jump into some samples and see if that holds true in real life. Poco F4 Long Term Review The main sensor produces very nice images during daytime, with good detail levels, great dynamic range, good, if not entirely accurate, color reproduction, good contrast levels, and noise reduction that's more subdued than on other mid-rangers. Sharpness can be a bit lacking in some shots, especially in the corners. Daytime samples from the main camera. The ultra-wide doesn't seem like much when you look at its specs, but it still manages to produce decent results, perhaps among the best we've seen coming from an 8MP sensor. Obviously this is still a far cry from any of the very good ultra-wide snappers out there, but it's a little bit more than we expected. The shots are nicely detailed, they have good sharpness, duller colors than the main camera, although there's an argument to be made that these may be a tad more accurate, generally well-contained noise, and good dynamic range. The automatic distortion correction seems to work rather well too. Daytime samples from the ultra-wide. If you hit the 2x zoom option in the viewfinder, you're getting cropped shots from the center of the main sensor, and not much else. There's no super residential zoom here or anything close to that. It's one of those nice-to-have modes that you probably shouldn't use too much if you care about picture quality. That said, on the phone's screen most of these shots look okay, with traits very similar to those exhibited by images that are captured with the main sensor. When you start zooming in you notice the lack of sharpness and clarity, but if you don't pixel peep, these are probably fine for a social media share. Daytime Zoom Samples At night there's an auto night mode option for the main camera and we recommend leaving this on, as the capture doesn't take so long that it's inconvenient. Yes it's a bit longer than it would be otherwise, but what you're getting are images that have good dynamic range and contrast, reasonably low noise levels, and pleasantly saturated colors, which are a bit more saturated than reality, but people seem to prefer that anyway. Detail levels are decent as well. Nighttime samples from the main camera. The manual night mode basically does the same thing as auto night mode, just more of it. Shot to shot times are longer, but still decent, we've definitely handled night modes that take a lot more time to process than this. We'd pick this over auto for the scenes that allow for it, as you do get a slightly brighter image with it than without, as well as some further enhanced highlights. And there doesn't seem to be any loss in quality in other regards either. Night mode samples from the main camera. Switch to the ultra wide and there's no auto night mode, so what you get are shots which are incredibly underexposed and noisy. Detail levels are bad, and the entire scene has this desaturated look that you may find a bit atmospheric in its own way. But accurate this definitely isn't. Nighttime samples from the ultra wide. Night mode helps somewhat making the resulting photos brighter and cutting down the noise to a certain extent, but the desaturated look remains, and we wouldn't really call these usable in the traditional way, maybe for an overly arty presentation? But as photos, they still aren't great. This is where the physical limitations of the sensor probably come into play, and hey, it's not all bad, at least it performs better during daytime. When the lights go down, we'd recommend sticking with the main camera if you can. Night mode samples from the ultra wide. The 2x zoom shots at night turn out to be similar looking to the 1x ones, but worse all round, in a very similar fashion to what happens during daytime when you go from 1x to 2x. In a pinch, 
sure these are generally usable, but definitely nothing to write home about. Since they're crops from the main sensor, the processing is very similar. Nighttime zoom samples. Applying night mode to 2x shots helps restore highlights to a certain degree, which is welcome, and you also get more detail in the shadows, at the cost of a very oversharpened look. You'll have to decide if that trade-off is worth it for you. As a general rule, we'd avoid using the 2x mode unless absolutely necessary, and only for those cases where it's impossible to zoom with your feet as they say. Night mode zoom samples. Selfies come out very good during the day, with accurate colors, if ever so lightly poppier than in real life, great contrast, good dynamic range, generally low noise levels, and decent sharpness. The camera has that weird setup we've seen a few times before, where the sensor is a pixel binning one but instead of saving 5MP shots it upscales them back to 20MP for whatever reason. This is done better than for some other handsets, as there doesn't seem to be a huge lack in detail levels, although more could still have been better. Alas, it is what it is. Selfie samples. At night things understandably take a turn for the worse, even if you have a decent light source around, you'll probably end up getting a barely usable result. Of course there's the option to use the screen flash if you want to, but keep in mind that nothing will save you from the sheer darkness of shooting in a pitch black environment. Portrait mode for selfies creates decent looking blur, but subject separation isn't always very good, with a lot of hiccups. Then again, sometimes it does work as it should so it's a matter of trying a few shots until you get a good one. The POCO F4 thus comes with a competent main camera, even if it doesn't have the best specs on paper. It's aided by OIS to create good-looking images both during the day and at night. On the other hand, the ultra-wide is better than what we expected from an 8MP sensor during the day, and about as bad as we thought it would be when the lights go down. The selfie snapper is, interestingly, a similar story to the ultra-wide, it produces fine images during the day and much worse ones at night, when the screen flash pretty much becomes mandatory, otherwise, you get mushy messes. POCO F4 Long-Term Review As usual in our long-term reviews we went with the default options and settings in a bid to show an approximation of the experience an average user would get from this phone. For the same reason, we didn't test the 64MP mode for the main camera since that's not the default and most people will never engage it, not to mention that pixel binning sensors are not supposed to be used like that in the first place, as they don't deliver their best performance unless binning occurs. Finally, note that we stopped testing macro shots for our long-term reviews since most dedicated macro cameras aren't very good, and the POCO F4S is no exception. If you want to see what it can do anyway, Please jump to our normal review of the phone where you can judge for yourself. Prepare to be disappointed, however. 6. Conclusion Conclusion The POCO F4 is a mid-ranger with an SoC that smokes all the other mid-rangers out there. The POCO F4 is a flagship killer with an older-than-expected SoC, thus taking a performance hit compared to what you'd want from such a model. Which of these statements rings true? Both actually. Thanks to the choice of including the aging, but top of the line in its heyday Snapdragon 870, it's hard to call the F4 a mid-ranger, since no other device in that category can hold a candle to its performance. POCO F4 Long-Term Review On the other hand, it seems like a stretch to call it a flagship killer, since those have always delivered top-notch performance, and the Snapdragon 870, while still fine for most day-to-day -day tasks and definitely a step above any mid-range chipset ever made, isn't exactly high-end anymore either. So that's what you need to contend with most. If you want performance that's better than what a mid-range smartphone can offer but don't need it to be flagship level, then the POCO F4 is just the phone for you. Unless you already own a POCO F3, in which case it doesn't really make a lot of sense to upgrade, you get the same chipset after all, and the improvement in charging time is welcome, but it's also exactly 14 minutes as advertised by the company, and 18 minutes as tested by us. That definitely doesn't warrant getting a new phone in our book, no matter how much we love ever faster charging.
The screen is 40% brighter, and that may make a difference in your day-to-day -day life, if you find the F3S too dim. But otherwise, there isn't much to differentiate these phones, despite the fact that they were launched 15 months apart. POCO F4 Long-Term Review With that in mind, you might expect us to recommend getting an F3, if you can still find one, instead of the F4, but the prices are so similar even today that we don't think it's worth it. The F4 has a real shot at running Android 13 someday, while with the F3 that's less of a given, considering POCO's track record on issuing such updates. And speaking of updates, definitely don't expect many of them if you buy a POCO. They are few and far between, and if you get lucky not to have any bugs that's fine, and was the case for us throughout our use of the F4. If the current software does have annoying issues, you'll be waiting multiple months for those to get fixed. That's the price you pay for the affordability of these devices compared to the competition, so we'd look at all of this as a matter of what you want to prioritize, software updates at the expense of performance and especially smoothness, Samsung, or performance, smoothness, and a generally lower price, POCO. MIUI itself is, in our opinion, in dire need of a new coat of paint, but if you haven't used it recently you're more likely to find it refreshing and enjoy its liberal use of animations throughout. POCO F4 Long-Term Review The POCO F4S screen, aside from being bright, is also high quality, its speakers are good if not mind-bogglingly so, and battery life has been great, owing to the lesser requirements of the chipset at least in part, no doubt. We got better endurance from the F4 than from the F4 GT which has a marginally bigger battery, but also a notoriously hungrier SoC. It wasn't orders of magnitude better, just a bit, but still. Charging in less than 40 minutes is definitely going to be shocking for people who've only used iPhones and slash or pixels, and a nice improvement for those who previously had a Samsung. Camera-wise the POCO F4 is good during daytime with both its main sensor, now aided by OIS, as well as the ultra-wide, which was a nice surprise. Don't expect its photos to be on PAR with the main camera, however. But for what it is, an 8MP sensor, it delivers pretty good results. At night the main one continues to churn out respectable shots, while the ultra-wide shows its limits. POCO F4 Long-Term Review the POCO F4S design may be rather bland, but that also means it's easy for it to blend into its surroundings and not stand out too much, which a lot of people may prefer. The value proposition of this phone is really weird, though. It's got a ton of pluses compared to a lot of the competition, but at the same time it's incredibly similar to its predecessor. This probably just goes to show what an outstanding deal the POCO F3 was when it came out. Clearly. The same can't be said about the F4, since it's hovering at around the same price, with the same chipset, coming out more than a year later. But the F4 is also not a bad deal, even today, you get the basics covered pretty well, and the only thing you're really missing from a flagship killer type device is a little bit of extra performance. POCO F4 Long Term Review And yet, the F4 is the smoothest phone we've ever reviewed long term that's powered by the Snapdragon 870, and in 90-95% to of the time it doesn't feel lesser than a flagship. Only when you go nuts with gaming or multitasking, or when the Google Play Store is installing or updating apps, will you notice that the SoC inside isn't top shelf anymore, even though it used to be. Hopefully this review has drawn a comprehensive enough image of what the F4 is like to use in late 2022 so that you can make an educated decision on whether to buy it or not. It's not perfect, but it's better than any mid-ranger, and close to a flagship killer while cheaper. That's a hard combo to pull off, and yet it does. Dance like there's no tomorrow. Hey!